and that's the way that is. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you hear a lot of, I mean, things in the later part in Elvis's life, you know, uh, things with a, well, when he was being mean, like, to the sweets and stuff on, on the, yeah. when he was being mean to the sweets, saying that well, they smelled it like... Depended, it depended on, on, number one, the mood Elvis was in. Unfortunately, it all depended on how much uh, the pills were still affecting him. It also, uh, Elvis had a weird sense of humor, and he expected everybody to uh, understand that most times he was kidding. Mm -hmm. And because people are around him that long, those of us, those of us who were around them, the guys. See, that's what the fans don't understand. The guys, especially those of us who were there from the beginning, the originals, who grew up with Elvis. We all developed the same sense of humor, the same, almost the same likes and dislikes and what have you. We understood. Plus the fact we cared enough about him to let him say whatever the hell he wanted to say because we knew he didn't mean it. We knew when Elvis meant something. We also knew when he was kidding around or, or doing, because we used to give it back to him too. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a two way street. And, and he knew us as well as we knew him. The Sweets and them and the people in the band really were not around Elvis that much except when they were on stage. So they didn't understand. Elvis, I mean, that was Elvis's humor. And that particular night, I will guarantee you, uh, the pills and the mood played part of of what made him say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he thought they would understand because they had been around, you know, they had been singing with him that much. And uh, they did. They took it personally. So what happened, Marty? I mean... Well, basically, uh, he, he said, had heard... The, what started it is he had heard some remarks uh, told to him, I think, by J.D. Sumner, who would stab anybody in the back. Uh, that... Uh, you mean that Captain fine, religious Captain man? Uh, <laughs> you mean that fine, religious man? Shit. I tell you some stories. And, <laughs> I've <yeah>. heard some. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay. Anyhow, uh, he was told some things that Kathy Westmoreland had said. Because, see, Kathy, she's, she's basically a nice guy, person, but, you know, sometimes we thought she had flipped off somewhere. And she exaggerates her relationship with Elvis a lot. Really? I mean, he liked her. She's a nice girl. But there was nothing serious there on Elvis's part. Anyhow, uh, she uh, said either to J.D. or somebody, whoever told Elvis that, she didn't particularly appreciate some of the things Elvis would say on stage when he introduced her, would have, or didn't like the way he introduced her. Mm-hmm. Well, that pissed Elvis off. So that night on stage, she said uh, something to the effect of, uh, this is the girl who sings the high, with the high voice, and uh, she's easy. She'll make it with anybody. That's right. That's what, yeah. And so she stormed off the stage. And and then he looked over to Sweet Inspirations. He said, I smell catfish. Now, he thought that was funny, see? Mm-hmm. And he thought they would understand. But everybody except Myrna took it personally and walked off with Kathy. So then Elvis walked over to Myrna because she stayed on stage. He took a ring off his finger and gave it to her. And she gave it back to him and said, no, I can't accept this. That's what that was all about. And mm-hmm. he explained. And, and see them walking off, it pissed him off. And so later, 
what I was told, you know, he sat and talked to them and told them, you know, he said, look, I don't mean anything by what I say to you, and you should know that. You know, you've been on stage with me long enough, and you know how crazy I am. And, uh, you know, there ain't no need in doing that again, and don't do it again. Right. I think he must have, my goodness, he, they just walked right off the stage. How long did they stay off? I don't know. I wasn't there. But, you know, I was kind of surprised that Estelle and them would do that. Because, see, I'm the one that recommended uh, them to Elvis in 69 mm -hmm. before he, uh, because primarily because their big hit record, Sweet Inspirations, was cut at American here in Memphis. Chips and them did it. And uh, so that's how I knew about them, because that was a great record. I knew it was a good R&B record, but it also had that gospel feel to it. Mm -hmm. And I knew Elvis would love them, because he originally was thinking about getting the Blossom. But the Blossoms were all tired, and they didn't hold the candle to Sweet Inspirations. I mean, the Sweets, you know, used to back Aretha and uh, and Dionne Warwick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that, you know, because quite frankly, I was trying to get Elvis to stay away from from the J.D. Summer type music and 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 that influence because. They didn't, uh, J.D. and even the Imperials, even though they're better than the Stamps, and and, uh, and I like most of the Imperials, mm -hmm. Elvis shouldn't have been on stage with a gospel, white gospel group. It's that simple. All he really needed was the sweets. But he only did that because of J.D. Really? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened? What happened, Marty? That there was a uh, all of a sudden there was the Imperials, and then there was the Stamps, and then there was the Imperials, and then Voice. What happened there? Well, I mean, they, originally the Imperials were with Jimmy Dean, mm -hmm. and uh, quite frankly, Jimmy Dean paid them more than Elvis did, and they had an opportunity to go back with Jimmy Dean, right? And they had asked, from what I heard, they had asked Parker and and Diskin for more money, and he wouldn't give it to them. And so they, and then at the same time, Jimmy Dean was going on either tour or playing in Vegas or somewhere, and uh, he, uh, they went, they went back with Jimmy Dean. Mm -hmm. And a voice was the biggest joke of all. What, what, what was that all about? Here again is the influence of J.D. See, there's, there's a, there's a vast difference between white and black gospel. Okay. Mm -hmm. The white gospel belongs in the category all itself, and it belongs in the category that it's not commercial music. It's it's uh, uh, you get you get a singer like Elvis that 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 basically his style from the very beginning, what he developed, was developed because of the influence of black music and country music back in the forties and, and early fifties. And then he, he he blended them both in for his own style. But there was a he had a a great uh, R and B basic foundation, blues foundation, as well as black gospel. Because in the early years, in the fifties and sixties, basically that's the gospel music you listen to, with the exception of one group, the Statesmen. Mm -hmm. Uh, but w we used to listen to the Harmonizing Four with Jimmy Jones, a great bass singer that put J.D.'s to shame, and the Golden Gate Quartet. We used to listen to them for hours uh, on, on, on record. And then when we'd go to Vegas in the early years before Elvis started performing there again, uh, uh, every night, almost every night, we were at the New Frontier listening to Clara Ward and her singers. Clara, Clara is from here in Memphis, and uh, uh, they were just fantastic. They're black, singer, black gospel singers. And it just, uh, it, it hurt Elvis, as far as I'm concerned, 
on the records and and on stage mm-hmm. to have JD in there. So then he gets this idea because uh, Donnie Sumner, JD's nephew or, or whatever he was, mm-hmm. uh, thought he had an idea that he would form this group and uh, see if Elvis would back him. They were terrible, first of all. Mm-hmm. And so they got Cheryl Nielsen and Donnie Sonner and Tim Beatty and some other joker. And Elvis got on his kick because uh, J.D. had suckered him into the white gospel, listening to it, and yada, 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 yada. And uh, Elvis thought he was going to be this great impresario and this manager and have his own group. And he, he, uh, this killed Parker. It killed Vernon Presley. Some of us, it didn't kill money, why, you know, uh, by, by kill, I mean, it upset them greatly right. because of the money and they felt Elvis was, didn't need this and he was wasting his money and, because Elvis paid for everything for these guys. Oh, really? And, uh, uh, then he put them on the show. And to us, to some of us guys, we just saw it as nothing but a con, and that it was taking Elvis so far away from what he really was. Mm-hmm. That's what bothered us. And uh, so, you know, that went on for a few years, and then he had enough, and he cut him loose. And one of them. One of them was, uh, I think it was Tim Beatty, started to supply Elvis with, with, with uh, stuff he shouldn't have been taking. Mm-hmm. And that's when uh, Red and Sonny and Dave Hebler found out and knocked on their door in Vegas and told them, you give Elvis anything else, we're going to break your legs. Of course, they went and cried to Elvis real quick, and Elvis got mad at Red and Sonny and, Red and Dave for that. Mm-hmm. Why do you, why all do they you, were trying to do was protect his ass. Yeah. Why do you think? What I mean, what uh, that you know? Why was Dave and Sonny and Red fired? Was it because of lawsuits? Because Elvis was influenced by two or three people. Vernon Presley, Joe Esposito, uh, Colonel Parker, and Dr. Nick jumped in there because he and Joe were were buddies. Uh, Vernon, number one, would be happy to get rid of anybody because he only looked at it with dollar signs. And he felt it. He felt it. None of us should be there because we were taking money away from Elvis, and as Elvis always put it, Daddy's always afraid I'm going to be broke, and he might have to go back to work. <laughs> mm-hmm. and how, how much did know, he listen? We all, we all understood Vernon being that way from the way he, you know, he sure. was before, because he was poor and, and yada, yada, but he never did like to work, period. Uh, as Elvis used to say, he's had a terminal back problem forever, you know, mm-hmm. he didn't have a back problem. Parker didn't like it because uh, Parker didn't want anything to upset the apple cart. Joe didn't like it because Joe, if if Joe had his way, he'd be the only one there. Mm-hmm. See, Joe thought he was something special, and he wasn't. Elvis didn't think he was special, and we didn't think he was special. So some of I mean, some of us liked Joe. We just didn't like what he did. I particularly did. Joe and I uh, always got along, but I particularly didn't like the way Joe talked to people, talked down to people. Mm -hmm. You know, and he loved telling people what to do. When I was a foreman, I asked them to do it. Mm -hmm. And there was a difference. And was he letting Parker know what was going on? Plus, he was letting Parker know what was going on. 
And Elvis knew that too. I don't know if I told you this before on the other interview, but when I was made... Yeah, yeah, you tell me that story. Yeah. Yeah. So were they... What was the reasoning that they would let go then? Oh, they... They started in on Elvis and saying, Elvis, you know, they're causing these lawsuits and yada, 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 and they're hitting people. The only time Red and Sonny hit anybody is to protect Elvis, and that was really in Tahoe. Uh, Sonny hit the guy first. The guy tried to break into Elvis' suite when he was told he was not invited and he couldn't come in by David Stanley. The guy got in an argument with David Stanley. The guy was about to hit David. He drew his hand back and was about to punch David, and Sonny stopped him. Sonny grabbed his arm and then knocked the hell out of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, they called security, and security came out. And the guy was belligerent. He was drunk. And he kept he kept uh, mouthing off and saying, you know, you, uh, I'll beat your ass and this, and he was saying it to Red and Sonny. And then Red just had enough. No, what happened was they put the guy in the elevator with security, and uh, the guy said something about Elvis. And that just set Red off again, so Red hit him. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact of the matter is the guy was a trespasser. He was an intruder, but he saw dollar signs, so he turned around and sued. He's not going to sue Red and Sonny because right. they ain't got any money. So he sues Elvis. Right. That's what caused the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So Parker, Vernon, Joe saw an opportunity as an excuse to keep talking to Elvis about these guys are costing you money, yada, 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 because they ended up settling the lawsuit mm -hmm. that Elvis had to pay for it. And uh, they're costing you big money, and they go around hitting people. They didn't go around hitting people. You know, they were doing their job. If if they hadn't got this guy when they got him, or one or two other people in all those years, and they had got to Elvis and hurt him, what do you think would have happened? Right. What do you think would have happened to Sonny and Red then? Hmm. They would have been fired. Mm -hmm. All they were doing was doing their job. Mm -hmm. But these these few people, you know, saw an opportunity. How, how in was Dr. Doctor... I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of the attitude. Okay. Because Charlie Hodge, may he rest in peace, was basically the same ilk. Elvis was mad at, I forgot who it was, two or three guys one time. And Elvis said, uh, said something, well, I'm, when they get up here, I'm going to fire them. And then Elvis went upstairs. And Charlie and, and a few of us were sitting downstairs in the den. The first words out of Charlie's mouth was, good, if he fires them, that's more gravy for us. Hmm. We all looked at Charlie when he said that. But that was Charlie, so that's the way he was. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, most of us, the original guys, we didn't think that way. None of us were there. Most of us, I should say, were there for, the, for what we could get or the money because, quite frankly, there was none. Well, what did you get paid, the pay, Marty? The pay, the pay sucked. Mm -hmm. A lot of people feel that, I mean, my God, you got cars and houses and, and uh, medical yeah. and they well, fed okay. you. And I'm, only, I'm saying what yeah. you said. Uh -huh. Yeah, we got cars, yeah, but uh, my, my my three children couldn't eat a car, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And when you when you start off working for Elvis and you have a wife and a child and he pays you $45 a week, mm -hmm. okay? That was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, six years before I ever got a car. Wow. I appreciated the car. Mm -hmm. We all appreciate it. But Elvis, I, I can guarantee you this, that Elvis knew that I was not there for what I could get. Because the only time, with the exception of one time, Elvis and I ever had an argument is when he wanted to give me something. See, 
Well, first of all, and I'm not patting my, I'm not an angel. I'm not patting myself on the back. That's not the way I'm made. Friendship means more to me than that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I was very cognizant of the fact that that's the way that could be perceived. And I'm, I'm, and he knew that I was not there for the money. I don't know if I told you this story before about paying him back. No. Did I? No. In 1963, I took a break and went back into radio. And at that time, I, w I had been offered a, uh, a uh, production director's job at WNOE in New Orleans. And we went down there. My son was born. And uh, back then, radio didn't pay all that much, although it paid more than Elvis did. And uh, so even though we had a hospitalization, I still had to pay extra money. And it took basically most of the money I had uh, for my, you know, for the procedure of my son being born and what have you and paying the hospital bill. And uh, the day after my son, we brought my son home, and I had just paid this big bill, and Alan Fortas had called me, you know, to uh, see how, how we were doing, how my son was, and, mm -hmm. and congratulate me. And I said, you know, we talked for a while, and I said, yeah, he's, you know, everything's fine. I said, except the hospital would like to kill me. You know, money-wise, I said, it's... Basically, all my money's gone, except what I get paid during the week. And uh, he said, uh, you want me to say something to Elvis? And I said, no, absolutely not. And he said, okay. Well, about four days later, I got a check in the mail that uh, Alan had sent from Elvis for 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I appreciate it, but it kind of pissed me off that Alan said it. Either. So I took that not as a gift, but as a loan that particular time. And uh, about six weeks later, my wife and I and my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, and my son was still a baby. We would come, we would come up to Memphis for the weekend, uh, and uh, so my parents could see the baby again. And uh, my wife and, and kids stayed stayed over that day. And, you know, they we were staying with my parents, and they they were at the, their house, and I went to Graceland. Elvis and them were in town, and. We were sitting out, out in the back, and it just so happens that that was the same day that Joe's oldest daughter, uh, Debbie, was being uh, baptized. And he had, he had named Elvis her, God, her godfather. But Elvis didn't want to go to the church, so he sent one of the guys in his place to stand in for him. So, so Elvis and I, I didn't... I wasn't told about the, the, the christening. I mean, they didn't know I was coming, so I didn't get an invitation. So I, I decided I was going to sit there with Elvis. And I had this little table out in the back. This is before the jungle room was built. Mm -hmm. And this was before initially that, that area was screened in. That wasn't even screened in. That. It was nothing but a back patio. And we had this round metal table out in the back, and Elvis and I were sitting there. And I said, where's everybody going? He said, uh, and then he told me about the baptism and that Joe had named him the Godfather. And then Ellis looked over to me and he says, you and I both know why he did that, don't we? <laughs> and so he, I, I knew Ellis was cognizant of that shit. So. Uh -huh. And he said, by the way, what'd you name your son? And I told him, I said, the fact is, I said, I, I almost named, gave him his middle name give him your middle name. I was going to call him Mark Aaron. And he said, well, why didn't you? He said, I, I would really have liked that. 
And I said, for the very reason you made that remark just now about Godfather. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't want anybody to get the wrong fucking idea. He said, Marty, I wouldn't have the wrong idea about you if you did that. I said, well, I appreciate that, but that's all well and good. So he got up to go inside, and I followed him. And we go through the kitchen and into the dining room, and he's in front of me with his back turned. And I said, Elvis, can I talk to you for a minute? Now, when someone said that to him, it usually meant, can I borrow or can I have? Can you let me have? And his, this is the way he said it. He said, yeah, what do you want? Oh, jeez. And I said, look, um, and I pulled this envelope out of my back pocket. I said, uh, I appreciated the $300 you sent me. And uh, I hadn't been able to save it all, but I've, I've got $50 that I want to give to you towards that 300 And it was like somebody hitting him with a brick. And he looked at me. And I, I just held it out, you know, and he wasn't going to take it. And I said, here. So he took it. And he started going out of the dining room, and he started up the steps to the to upstairs. And he turned around, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, you don't know what this means to me. I said, why? He said, you're the first person that's ever paid me back anything. And I said, well, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. And he ran upstairs. I went back outside and sat at the table, and he came out about 15 minutes later, and he said, here, I want you to take this back. And I said, no, it's yours. I said, you know, I appreciate what you did. And I'll pay you back the rest of it as soon as I can. He said, I don't want your money. He said, you take this back. He said, just the thought of you and that gesture of trying to pay me back, he said, is enough for me. And I said, no, Elvis. I said, that's your money. He said, if you don't take it back, son of a bitch, <laughs> pardon my English, I'm going to burn it. I said, well, it's your money, you burn it if you want to. <laughs> and it was a, this was a time when he smoked cigarettes, and there was a pack of cigarettes and a lighter on the table, and he picked up the lighter, and he struck it and uh, had it at the corner or edge of the money, and he was going to burn it. And I said, whoa, hold on. If you're going to really burn it, I said, don't do that. Let me have it back. And... Uh, uh, you ought not burn it. So he handed it back to me. And about two months later, he had Alan call me and ask if I wanted to come back to work for him. And I, I was tired of radio, and I said, yeah, I would. My wife wasn't too happy, but when I went back to work for him, I told his father the first thing. I said, take $25 out of my pay every week until the 300 is paid back. I wasn't going to let it go. Mm -hmm. And he did. And you paid him back? I paid him back. Hmm. But see, that's... That's... Elvis knew these things about... I mean, he was, he, he was aware of these things, not that he wanted people to pay him back, because most of the times he gave guys money, even if the check said personal loan, it was a gift. The reason he put personal loan on there is for tax reasons. Uh, so when I became foreman and I was the one who wrote the checks out, that was the first thing I was told by him by his father and by Bill Fisher, the accountant at the time, when Elvis gives anybody money, any of the guys money, you write personal loan on there. It's not a loan, it's a gift, but we need that for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. Because when you put personal loan on there, you don't have to pay gift tax. Sure. 
and uh, that was the money that uh, uh, Priscilla sued me to try to get back from me. Really? Huh. And she didn't get anything? Huh? She didn't get anything? No. No. Like she didn't oh, have she enough. Didn't, she fooled with the wrong guy. Because I countersued her. She, as soon as I countersued her, she dropped the suit. But she was going to use me as a test case against all the guys. Mm -hmm. She's a lovely person. <laughs> I got a question for you. Um, Aloha from Hawaii. Was it was yeah. 1973? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the uh, the gentleman is talking to Elvis uh, before the concert or something. It was a promo they did for it. Elvis seems a little bit under the weather when he's talking to the guy. What was going on there? They later said that he had a toothache. Elvis took sleeping pills. Uh -huh. Elvis took sleeping pills to go to sleep. And the sleeping pills, unfortunately, hadn't worn off by the time he did that interview because you got to understand that uh, uh, we used to stay up all night and sleep during the daytime. All this time. <laughs> yeah. And the rehearsals were even at night. So, unfortunately, they scheduled that interview a little too early. And anybody who has taken sleeping pills know knows the feeling. Uh huh. That's what that's what that was. That's what that was. Because, quite frankly, for two weeks straight, before Aloha, Elvis stayed off of just about everything with the occasional sleeping pill, because he needed it. Because, so he would get wound up so much. I mean, that's what that business does to you. I mean, I took sleeping pills. All the guys, most of the guys, took sleeping pills. Because you get so wound up, and then especially when you 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 stay up all night, you really wound up. Sometimes you get too tired that you can't sleep, mm -hmm. and so we had to have that so that we would be able to function the next night. We had to have our rest. A lot of entertainers do the same thing. The problem is, is when you start abusing that stuff, mm -hmm. when you start taking too much. And uh, that's what happened with Elvis, you know, uh, on different stuff at a different time. But for that particular instance, that's basically what that is. I know I've heard people talk about that before. Right. Uh, he was uh, stoned out of his mind when he did the interview because he slurred his he slurred his words because the sleeping pills had not worn off. Mm -hmm. They they did that interview too early in the day for him. Mm -hmm. And they sure enough. Yeah. Now, which is another, which which scuttles another fallacy about Colonel Parker saying after Elvis died that he didn't know about Elvis's drug problem. And by drugs, I mean primarily prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. Parker knew. Parker didn't give a damn as long as Elvis could get on the stage. Mm-hmm. Marty, were you ever around when Elvis uh, shot off his pistol? The what? Were you ever around when uh, Elvis took out his uh, gun and shot something? Was I ever around? Yeah. Yeah, I ducked a lot of times. <laughs> what was that? He just like to psych you guys out by doing shit like that? Uh, Elvis felt that he was invincible. Did he really? Nothing he could, could touch get him. Away. He could get away with doing anything he wanted because he was Elvis Presley. And he could. Basically, he could. And that's why... If he didn't like something, he just, because uh, he always had a gun on him, uh, he just whipped out the gun and shot it, mm -hmm. you know. All of you guys carried guns? Yeah. Hmm. No, no, I wouldn't say all, but most of us did. Okay. I'm going to ask you another... We were, we were all uh, special deputies in the... Right. Shelby County uh, Sheriff's Department, and uh, we all had guns. We all had to go through uh, firing range uh, testing and everything else. Mm -hmm. Because, unfortunately, you never knew when some nutcase would try something. 
What mm-hmm. else? Do you remember any uh, death threats? I remember death death threats, but nothing ever materialized. You know, there was one in Vegas, mm-hmm. two in Vegas, but uh, nothing really materialized. And uh, you know, did you shake Elvis up when there were threats? Yeah, it bothered him. It bothered him. It bothered him because. One, he couldn't understand why anybody would want to kill him. He didn't do anything to anybody. Right. And two, it bothered him because uh, he was Mr. Law and Order. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> was he? <laughs> and he didn't, uh, he didn't understand why somebody wanted to be a criminal and do something like that. Uh, but uh, basically what both of them were were extortion plots. That's all they were. Mm-hmm. But the guy never got money, and they never caught him. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question for you. You need not ask it, answer it if you don't want to. Uh, what years did that Larry Geller work for Elvis? Oh, that's really easy. 64 to 67. 64 to 67. And then, then he came back in 76. See, Larry's got a problem, like a few others do. They have a problem exaggerating uh, their time with Elvis and the relationship with Elvis. Larry came to Vegas after 67 in 72 with Johnny Rivers. Neither one of them were invited, okay? But they came to see the show, and then, of course, they wanted to come backstage. So evidently, Larry is counting that as coming back in 72. But I was around Elvis up until late 76, fall of 76, okay? Mm-hmm. From, and I wasn't there in 72 when Larry came with, uh, with Johnny Rivers, who Elvis didn't like either. But when they got home, Elvis and the guys told me about Larry showing up with Rivers. Mm-hmm. From the time Geller was let go in 67, he says he quit, but he was really let go because Parker got rid of him, until uh, 76, I never saw, well, actually, I, I wasn't there after 76 when Geller showed up. I never saw Larry Geller on tour in Memphis, in L.A., in Vegas, nowhere. None of the guys saw him. I've asked them because I've read what Larry has said and and here and there. Mm -hmm. Larry is basically a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't like... uh, how Larry tried to fill Elvis's head with all that California, as I put it, California cult crap, because that's exactly what it is. He uh, he uh, dislikes it when I when I call it that. But I've seen these people in California. Basically, that's where it is. Who who who? Uh, in my opinion, they're weak-minded people. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'll follow anything and anybody. See, one time I'll give you an example. When when Geller was working for Elvis as his hairstylist, we were going to L.A. And uh, this is when Elvis had the Dodge Motorhome, before we had the big bus, and before he had the, when he didn't get the airplane till later in the seventies. And Elvis was driving, and Larry and I were standing behind Elvis. We were two talking, and uh, once again, Larry steered the conversation to religion, and yada, 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 yada. And Elvis knew, and I knew, and a couple of other guys knew that Larry had an ulterior motive. So all of a sudden, Larry says, you know, Elvis, with how the fans love you and follow you and yada, yada, you could be a great messenger with a religious message. 
And first of all, I knew that was embarrassing Elvis. I knew that's not what Elvis wanted. And I said to him, Larry, you need to get off of that. I said, Elvis is not a messenger. He's not going to... You're not going to put on a robe and leave, leave people through the desert, okay? I said, Elvis uh, influences people uh, in some way. His message comes through his music. Uh, that's why people love Elvis. And that's why they're fans of his. And he's not some religious messenger, and I doubt that he ever will be. Elvis is sitting there, and Larry starts in again. I said, Larry, I'm just telling you, you need to leave it alone, change the subject. And so Larry looks at Elvis, and he says, well, you know, don't you think, and Elvis just looked at Larry. He said, Larry, Marty's right. Just change it. My message comes through my music, and that's the way it will always be. Because mm -hmm. uh, what Larry was after was for Elvis to be this great new messenger, this leader, and guess who his assistant was going to be? <laughs> and guess who was going to raise all this money, you know, through religion, just like most religions do? Because uh, that's what, I don't want to get into this, because yeah. most that's what most organized religion is to me. It's nothing but money mm -hmm. and power. You know, if you believe in God, you don't need all that stuff. Okay. And I, I strongly believe in God. Mm -hmm. And that we're all children of God, you know. But but that's another, I don't, I don't even want to get into that. Mm -hmm. It's just personal belief and philosophy. Well, I'm going to have to change the tape here in a minute uh, okay. again. But I, I want to ask you, uh, you probably get in one short question on here. The 24 karat gold Cadillac that was made, did Elvis well, at the 24 carat gold Cadillac that George Barris made that's now in the Country Hall of Fame. Did Elvis even ever drive that thing around? <laughs> yeah, uh, for a short time. He really uh, did? I, God, I don't yeah, think... but it wasn't It wasn't a 24 carat gold. I mean, it was gold flex and all that stuff, but the right. outside was white with the gold flex in it. Right. And uh, Elvis got a kick out of it. It had a loudspeaker system. Uh -huh. where you could talk to people outside the car. And of course, back then in the 60s, uh, that was something that was space age at the time. Yeah. And, uh, but that was just short-lived, and that's why it was put in there. Yeah. That car, that car, touring, made more money than a lot of artists do. Yeah, I can't... <laughs> But you don't even see a picture of Elvis driving it. I mean, and I questioned if it was even... if he even drove it. He not so much drove it as, as sat in the back. Really? It, so you remember that car sitting in the back of Graceland? Oh, yeah. I, I rode in the car with him. How'd it ride? <laughs> Cadillac limousine. Yeah. <laughs> 